Um, so next we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Mike Burrow, one of our PGY3 residents, who's going to be discussing a case that's uh, likely non-physiologic. And then uh, Dr. Becca Ginter is going to close our morning uh, discussing a case of active neuropathy and end-stage uh, renal disease. Thanks, Chris. All right. Let me see if I can. This will work. So this is a, a case um, from when I was on call a little over a year ago. So in December 2017, I was called by the Children's ER. Uh, they, they said the, the words that are music to my ears, you don't need to see this patient, but can you help me schedule follow-up, please? And I said, well, okay, we'll tell you what's going on. They said uh, a nine-year-old girl had come in, um, brought by her mother, complaining of some vision, some blurry vision a little bit, maybe some double vision, and her mom was the one that actually said, you know, she, I think she just wants glasses. She's kind of been mentioning this for a little while, but I kind of to teach her a lesson. I'm bringing her in, and so... And, and the ER doctor did an examination and, and didn't find anything abnormal, so agreed, but just wanted to get her in and see if she needed a pair of glasses. I said, okay, well, um, tell me a little bit more about what, uh, what the patient is describing. And uh, he sa she said, well, she says she only sees two images when both eyes are open, um, but it's not always two images. Sometimes she looks at a face and she sees three eyes and two noses and one and a half mouths. And, and just the, the story wasn't fitting very well. I mean, I, I don't think it's very often that you get someone that young that can um, be that precise about what they're seeing. And, and so it just didn't sit very well. So I, I, I said, you know, why don't, I'm, I'm here. Why don't I come and just check in with the patient and see what's going on? Um, I got there and, well, before I actually even went in the room, Mom even pulled me aside and said the same thing. She said, thanks for, you know, seeing us, but I, I hope, hopefully this doesn't waste your time. But, and said again, I, I think she just wants a pair of glasses, but... There's a little bit more to her story. About one week prior uh, to coming in, so this was around Christmas Eve, uh, mom said that she, or the patient had said she felt dizzy, she took a nap, and then she even had an episode of nausea and vomiting, but mom just kind of thought it's from eating too much junk food from the holidays. Uh, she then started to say she was seeing two images of certain things, but again, mom kind of brushed it off a little bit. Uh, talking to the patient, she said it doesn't last all day, um, but it would happen for some time period of every day for at least the last week before she came in. And then, like I mentioned before, it's intermittent horizontal binocular double vision, but not always the exact same. At the time, she said she wasn't having any vision problems, but she was before they got roomed in the emergency room. She had no other pertinent medical history. She wasn't taking any medications, no eye problems um, in her, and then just a few medical problems that had run in the family. Um, her initial exam, so she's 20-20 in both eyes, she had full color vision, with almost full color vision without any uh, red desaturation, and her stereopsis was full. Her visual fields were full, her pupils were normal, her extraocular motility was full, and on just alternate cover testing at bedside, there was no tropiophoria elicited. Uh, she had a little bit of end gaze nystagmus, but the, the kicker was she had some subtle upbeat nystagmus and pri primary gaze and worsened on up gaze. And her ILPs were normal. And then just, just to kind of appease mom more than anything, you know, I had told her, well, I'll just throw on a pair of readers. And, you know, if she miraculously says everything's better, maybe. So I threw on a pair of readers. And she said, no, that I, you know, things still seem a little blurry. But at this point, I think, you know, the, the jig was up. The rest of her exam was uh, completely normal. Her slip map exam was normal. And her dilated fundus exam was normal. So... In summary, we had a nine-year-old, otherwise healthy girl, recent episode of nausea and vomiting, and had one week of this intermittent horizontal binocular diplopia with normal vision, or normal visual acuity and stereoacuity, but she had upbeat nystagmus and primary gaze, worse than on up gaze. So the differential, so it kind of makes, you know, your hair stand on in a little bit when you find somebody that has upbeat nystagmus, so a broad differential for um, upbeat nystagmus would be uh, so lesions in the brain stem, so whether it's infarction, ischemia, neoplasm, or demyelinating disease. Um, and then, of course, you have toxic and metabolic causes, seizures, encephalitis, meningitis, vasculitis. Uh, Chiari malformations are a common one, a more common one, and then cerebellar degeneration, and then there's also drug-induced. She really didn't fit any of the bottom ones. She hadn't had any imaging, so I guess we couldn't know a few of those, but um, certainly there was concern for possible neoplasm. Um, the pathophysiology of uh, upbeat nystagmus is not fully understood. 
it's suggested that because this is most often seen in lesions with the pontomedullary or pontomesencephalic regions, that it's an imbalance in the vertical vestibular ocular pathways. Um, but again, the exact mechanism is, is unclear. Just a few examples of some of those lesions. This is not our patient. So it was kind of a, um, a bummer to kind of tell mom, like, you know, I you came in, thought maybe just a pair of glasses would do it, but I actually think she needs an MRI. And mom was, was distraught at this point, just worried, you know, of course not upset that she brought her in, but just a little more worried. So we sent her for an MRI, and this is her MRI, which showed um, pontine tumefaction, uh, most likely neoplastic and etiology, and strongly suggestive of what's called DIPG or diffuse um, intrinsic pontine glioma. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, this specific tumor uh, in a minute. She was admitted to the hospital, so this was uh, the day after she's admitted to the hospital. She underwent biopsy of the tumor, which I, I thought was really interesting. I didn't even think that was something they would pursue. But she did have stereotactic biopsy, which uh, talking to, we have a, luckily a neurosurgery resident on the neurology or neuro-ophthalmology service right now, so I was talking to Brandon and he kind of walked me through this. So basically they do preoperative imaging um, and then once they have the patient in the OR, they're able to kind of link that preoperative imaging with a probe that's able to um, pinpoint exactly where they want to take the biopsy. They then put the patient's head in a, in a brace and then they will clear the area where they want to go after identifying it with the preoperative imaging, make a burrow hole, and then they're able to go in with the um, uh, biopsy cannula, if you will, and take biopsies. They took six specimens total, which also seemed like a lot to me, but again, talking to Brandon, they, that's, that's necessary if you're really wanting to do genetic testing um, in addition to pathology and things, and that was the case. Uh, her biopsy revealed the presence of this H3K27M mutation. So DIPG, a little bit about the epidemiology. Um, in general, primary pediatric brain tumors are rare. Uh, there's about 2,000, a little more than 2,000 cases annually. But about 15 to 20 percent of these are DIPG. And unfortunately, it's, it has among the most dire uh, of prognoses. It's the leading cause of death from um, pediatric brain tumors. And the median age of presentation is seven, and there's no gender predilection. This is a tumor that arises from astrocytes in the ponds. Um, it very rarely metastasizes because it is just basically infiltrative of the pond itself, um, but it can uh, to local sites along fiber tracts. And it is always considered highly malignant, no matter the pathology grade that you would normally assign, whether it's WHO classification, just because of the um, or I guess the, the characteristics of progression of this tumor, it's always considered high grade. The classic presentation, it kind of has a classic triad, uh, is cranial nerve palsies, especially cranial nerve six and seven, and then long tract signs or um, higher motor neuron signs such as hyperreflexia, clonus, hypertonia, positive Babinski. Um, I, I have to admit I didn't check for Babinski or many higher order signs in her but in a follow-up neurosurgery note, there were none that were noted. And then ataxia would complete the triad. The symptoms associated with that triad, of course, diplopia, facial asymmetry, clumsiness, and ataxia. And then you can also develop signs and symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure, uh, just if there, is, if there is elevated intracranial pressure from um, just anatomic, anatomic blockage of the uh, outflow of CSF. Diagnosis has really uh, historically been just by clinical signs and symptoms and time frames. So this, since it progresses so quickly, um, symptom duration is usually, usually less than three months at the time of diagnosis. And then of course you get imaging. And there are these kind of characteristic findings on imaging. Um, MRI is most common, but CT you get isodense or hypodense enlargement of the pons. And then MRI you'll get hypodense enlargement of the pons on T1 or diffuse bright signal on T2 or flare imaging. Variable contrast enhancement, but it's usually absent, and then you can have necrosis at later stages. Uh, the prognosis is nearly 100% fatal, um, and without radiation, which is currently the only approved, uh, identified effective treatment, the median survival is four months. Um, Post-radiation, median survival is between eight and 11 months, so quite a, quite a horrible prognosis, and the survival rates are, are, are abysmal. Uh, less or 30% at one year, 10% at two years, and less than 1% at five years. 
Uh, as I mentioned, the only currently proven treatment is radiation therapy. Many chemotherapeutic agents have been tried, um, but have not found to be significant or significantly prolonged survival. Uh, the barriers to treatment are suggested um, as just the location itself, it's not amenable to surgical debulking or procedures. Um, and then the blood-brain barrier is thought to be preserved in DIPG, which is why the chemotherapeutic options uh, are, are not, uh, they're, they're not helpful. And then there's also a poor understanding of just the underlying molecular and cellular biology, just because we haven't ever taken biopsies before. This is such an aggressive tumor. Um, and so I think that's something that's interesting now. And uh, we hear a lot about that. I mean, in, in ophthalmology, too, we talk a lot about these retinal dystrophies that we're now targeting with personalized medicine. Um, and I think that's the case here, too. It's, it's kind of neat to see. So, so again, why, why biopsy is really um, a move towards this personalized medicine. So there's a journal just talking about this H3K27M mutation, a journal article that if it wasn't bad enough that DIPG is such a poor prognosis that the presence of this mutation is actually, it actually confers a worse prognosis and patients uh, tend to uh, progress much more quickly. That's just a description of what the mutation um, is. Um, it just, it, well, you can read it up there. It leads to the amino acid substitution of lysine from thionine and this just leads to poor physiologic differentiation of the drive to um, gliomogenesis. So I, last part of this, I just want to talk, um, end on a, on a more happy note, uh, is that there are some novel treatments um, and di diagnostic procedures that are coming up. Um, so two that I want to just really talk about are this, there's a, tr a clinical trial ongoing with this treatment of ONC201. And then I, I thought there was an interesting um, a method of drug delivery that's being studied right now. It's not in clinical trial stages that I could see, um, but it's in the in the laboratory stages, which is called magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound. So I'll talk about that first. This is just kind of a one slide summary of what that is. Um, in this case, they're, they're testing it on mice, and what they'll do is they'll inject into a tail vein uh, micro bubbles. I think that's been kind of a, a hot topic for maybe 10 years. I've seen it in various um, uh, fields. They inject micro bubbles and then their agent of choice. So in this study case, they're injecting uh, nanoparticle conjugates with um, gold. Um, and that's just so that they can see if the treatment is actually getting to where they want it. So they inject it in the tail vein. They've previously done MRI imaging, and then they target the area where they like the treatment to arrive. And then they use high focus ultrasound to um, theoretically activate or excite the microbubbles that then disrupt the blood-brain barrier, so the endothelium part of the blood-brain barrier, allowing the treatment to seep through the targeted area. So I think it's a pretty interesting um, and hopefully exciting and, and future opportunity for, for to overcome some of these barriers in treatment of things like DIPG. Uh, the, the other thing I just want to talk about, spend a little bit of time on, is this <laughs> clinical trial that's going on. There, there are about 45 clinical trials going on regarding T DIPG, which I think is exciting, um, most of which are interventional. Um, our patient has actually been enrolled in this trial uh, for ONC201. So ONC201 is a small, selective, direct, competitive antagonist of the D2-like dopamine receptor. Um, so the, the mechanism is still kind of under investigation, but it's thought that this activates what's called the intrinsic stress response, induces the overexpression of the death or apoptosis ligand, tumor, tumor necrosis factor related ap apoptosis inducing ligand or trail. And then this leads to a cytotoxic effect towards cancer cells in particular. So not clearly understood why it's so directed towards cancer cells, but it's been studied in several other cancers such as pancreatic, colon, breast, and cervical. Um, and has been found to be effective. So it's currently being studied in DIPG as well. So back to our patient. Um, so she was diagnosed on uh, the 29th of December in 17. That biopsy was done two days later where she was found to be positive. And then she began radiation. I mean, this is quite a fast moving process and I think we can all see why, but uh, almost just two weeks later, she started radiation. That was done over a period of about six weeks. And, um, and then after, um, that six weeks, about a month later, she was enrolled in this trial. Uh, this, there's several sites, but she goes to the one in NYU. She does monthly visits for this onc one administration, which interestingly is an oral medication. Uh, and then she gets interval MRIs here at uh, Primary Children's about every two months. 
She actually follows with Dr. Jardine at this point and has most recently been seen earlier this year and her visual symptoms resolved after radiation and they haven't returned. And she also visits with the HEMOG team at Children's and she's been relatively symptom free since receiving radiation. Just as comparison, so this is her most recent MRI. I'm going to pull up some pictures from previous just for comparison. I think it's quite the, quite the change. So I think um, th this was just a really interesting case for me, um, and I think, like I mentioned, we've had a lot of talks recently about um, personalized medicine, whether it be in the retinal dystrophies or at a recent FA conference we talked about Batten's disease, which can be an equally devastating diagnosis. But I do think that it's exciting and important for, um, for us to realize that there are clinical trials going on. Um, you know, in Batten's disease, I think a few of the patients we talked about are, are being enrolled in clinical trials, and then in, in our case, in this patient we just discussed, an otherwise uh, very dismal prognosis has led to someone who's had, I mean, had a remarkable response to treatment and is already beating the odds and hopefully will continue to do so. And that's it. Any questions? Question. Yeah, Dr. Olson. So first a comment, congratulations. The easy thing to have done would be just to blow the patient off. <laughs> And, and we need to remember non-physiologic is a diagnosis of exclusion. Yeah, we just have to be so careful. I just When I first came here, uh, the chief of neurology had taken the daughter of, our, of the uh, head of orthopedic surgery and called her symptoms non-physiologic when it turned out that it was a barium aneurysm that later ruptured. And it created incredible ill will and bad feelings. And, and so... Uh, there are plenty. Of, there are plenty of patients in which we can't. We just. We just need to be very, very cautious. Absolutely. I'm just blowing these things off because, uh, uh, particularly, a lot of these subtle things early on, it, and it's hard for patients to describe. So it may not sound consistent because they're having a hard time describing exactly what's going on. Absolutely, Dr. Patel. So we come across this in plastics not infrequently, and here's a little tip. Supposing you hadn't seen that, I presume it was subtle vertical nystagmus. <clears throat> and, you know, we don't do a general neurological exam to see gait and stuff normally. Uh, you know, a good thing, you'll see me doing this with emergency patients all the time, is I say, let me see them in clinic in two weeks or a month or six weeks. And that business of looking at your patient again two or three times, sometimes with the fresh eyes through a resident like you before I go in, and then we sort of discuss this, will often shed light. And we've come across very subtle orbital tumors, we've come across very subtle findings of skin cancer, uh, which the patient says, oh, I'm sure it's there, you can't see it at first, first blush. So, that, that, so if you, had you not found anything, the answer would have been, yes, come and see us in Dr. Hoffman or Dr. Jardine's clinic, and then view it more than once. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Penny. Just one other comment, Beck. I know you want to get going. So I, I, I love hearing these stories. Um, you know, we see what we want to see, and this goes into the realm of kind of confirmation bias, where we see the things we expect to see. There was a, a, a really cool study they did where they asked radiologists to, to find the lung tumor in a chest x-ray, and they had inserted pictures of gorillas uh, or other animals that 83% uh, of the radiologists missed the fact that there were these animal images uh, in the chest x-ray. And it's so powerful, particularly when, when we don't want to find the diplopia in the five o'clock patient at the end of the day. You know, it's like we, we want to confirm the things that, that we're hoping for, and, and particularly being on call, being first line, this is, this is vitally important that we keep an open mind. We, we don't rely on, on another type of bias, which is this expert bias. You know, Dr. Olson refers something to me. If I don't do my due diligence to ensure that this is the actual diagnosis, that's an error on me. And so. Uh, particularly as you're seeing patients from attendings, keep, keep, keep your mind open. And thank you. It's great. Dr. Warner? Just a little tip um, that uh, it's, it can be relatively easy to see nystagmus uh, using the direct ophthalmoscope, um, whereas, uh, you know, without a good slip lock exam, it might be hard. Um, with the naked eye, it can be hard to see uh, subtle nystagmus. With, with, the, with the direct, the magnification there is good. <laughs> Big, very big. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Want to vote for the direct ophthalmoscope? Yay! <laughs>
What, what is that again? What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you turned that on? <laughs>